All right, I see a lot of people are coming in, but um, let's get started. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining um, the Network of Centers learning call on the state of AI regulation across the globe. Um, we're excited that so many of you are joining us from across the globe this morning. And um, I imagine people will continue to trick it, trickle in, but we have so many wonderful things to talk about today that we are just going to go ahead and get started on time. So this will be an hour long call ending on the hour. Um, we uh, will have three rounds of um, uh, questions uh, and topics. Um, we'll be talking about um, what's happening for AI regulation in various regions in the world. Um, the first section will be an introduction to what's happening in um, Africa, in Brazil, in the United States, and in the EU. Uh, in the next section, we'll be talking about risks and rights aspects of AI regulation. And finally, we'll have a lightning round in which the panelists uh, will talk about how we can work together towards global policy going forward. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Sylvan. I'm um, moderating the, uh, the uh, panel today. Um, I'm the Senior Director for Strategy and Programming at the Berkman Klein Center. And um, if you have any comments you want to be making about um, the event itself, uh, please go ahead and put in the chat. We will all see your comments on the panel. Um, if you have a particular question uh, that you would like to ask the panel or you would like the panel to address, uh, you can put that in the Q&A function. And with that, um, if you have any questions, go ahead and, and put them in the chat or the Q&A. But with that, um, let's begin. So um, I'd like to start with you, Ridwan. Uh, Ridwan, uh, you uh, are the Assistant Director for Professional Development at CERTA, uh, the newest center uh, that has joined the Network of Centers. So we are very excited that you are able to join us today to, um, to represent uh, your centers, uh, your Center for Law and Innovation in Rwanda. And I know that you uh, authored a report recently on uh, the state of AI regulation across the continent of Africa, um, and that you have a great expertise in, um, in not only uh, the, the issues and dynamics in Rwanda, but also uh, have, have worked with and, and been in conversation with other countries. So, you know, um, what I'd love to hear from you now is um, what uh, what are some of the findings from this report that you wrote, and um, can you can you introduce uh, the audience uh, to the approaches that have been taken um, by different African countries um, as they think about how to address AI regulation for their nations. All right, so I'm seeing that you're going to you're saying something about calling in, and so I might move on to um, ah, there we go. Um, so thank you, um, Nagla. Uh, yes, I I think everyone was muted for a second there. So um, Carlos, um, I I understand. Uh, so Carlos, you are a, a director of the uh, ITS Rio uh, organization. You also teach at Rio de Janeiro State University. Um, and you have been involved in many, many regulation efforts um, in Brazil um, and uh, across Latin America and beyond. Um, but to start, I would love to hear uh, your comments on Brazil itself. Um, I know Brazil is going to be hosting the G20 in November and is actively developing new national regulations for AI. How is the development of that regulation going? Uh, what do we anticipate um, it be, uh, being included in it? And um, what will we see the impacts of the, that regulation? So thanks, Liz. Uh, and I'll go super quickly here, but since I, I'm the one uh, speaking first here, let me just uh, take a, like a a step back and then include Brazil in a larger context on how do we see the conversation around 
AI regulation like moving forward uh, on a global basis. Like this is at least I would say a decade journey. In if we go back to ten years, we would see a lot of uh, like uh, charters on principles on AI being spread out uh, and coming out from from different governments uh, and and different like uh, entities. And we could say that at some point, those very broad charters on principles, they were somehow uh, like reflected in national strategies. So we, we end up seeing, I would say like in the last five years, uh, a lot of national strategies on AI. And then if we could put it like in a, in a very like simplistic way, and then we have like a third phase of an actual like proper regulation with like proper laws on AI. And the reason I'm I'm like designing this like a very broad uh, three step uh, a period on on tackling the issue of AI is because Brazil ended up like uh, fitting quite nicely uh, in this uh, in this frame because uh, if we go back a bit uh, during the pandemic, uh, Brazil launched a national strategy uh, on AI. And let me just pinpoint that because I think it's a good example. Uh, there was like a, a lot of response from academia and civil society in the public consultation to design this national strategy, but the result ended up leaving uh, a good chunk uh, of academia and civil society disappointed on uh, how this public consultation ended up being reflected on the national strategy. But at the same time, as we had the national strategy, National Congress ended up developing uh, some proposals for a law and two views of law ended up appearing in the National Congress. There was one in 2020 that was very much principles based, like a, it didn't move the needle much, uh, but it was approved in the House of Representatives. And most recently, we had another one that was uh, commissioned out of uh, a group of legal experts that ended up putting up uh, this new text. And this new text is set to be voted on in the, in, in the Senate uh, quite soon in Brazil. But the reason I mentioned this is just to say that we have in Brazil these discussions on the government, on thinking about a national strategy that was uh, put up a while ago. We had discussions in the legislative power with proper laws being discussed. Uh, and of course, on top of this, you have the whole political conversation about the G20 and how a country such as Brazil uh, want to have AI as one of the the hottest topics to to discuss uh, in this global in this global conference. So by the end of the day, it seems like you cannot detach uh, politics, geopolitics, the uh, the framing of law, and how technology advances in this in this whole discussion. And, and Brazil is just a, one of the examples, and and probably we can. Uh, go through other countries, and we see much likely uh, the same experiences and the same struggles. But I'm just stopping here, uh, just to, to send Brazil as one of the examples of our of our discussion. Thank you, Carlos, for for doing that broader fr framing as we as we pivoted the order here. Um, uh, Ridwan, shall we shall we try again? Shall we see if you can <clears throat> if your audio is working now? Yeah, I think we have to <clears throat> turn in, him into a host. So we do that. As we continue on um, with our conversation, um, and Sia, maybe you can help Ridwan uh, to, to get his, uh, his audio going. Um, as I uh, shift the conversation uh, to Mason. Uh, Mason, you are uh, a... Uh, clinical uh, staff at the Cyber Law Clinic at the Berkman Klein Center, where you both uh, run a law practice and teach uh, cyber law. Um, you have been um, working on a whole variety of different AI and technology um, uh, 
legal issues with your clients and your students for, for many years now. Uh, and I wanted to ask you a bit about the U.S. approach to AI regulation. Um, it's different in, uh, some, than some other um, uh, regulation uh, from other countries in that it began with an executive order. It's been implemented through uh, multiple uh, federal departments and only in the last week has Congress proposed a roadmap for AI policy, uh, which includes funding for research and development, but um, no regulation. So um, I know you understand the uh, the approach that the U.S. is taking and, and have many thoughts about it. Would you mind describing this approach for those of us who, who would like to hear a little bit more detail? Uh, what's significant about the differences um, from other approaches globally? Um, and, and including, you know, the dynamics of our federalized system in which U.S. states play important roles in U.S. policy. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Liz. Um, so I, I think there's two things that really make the um, the U.S. approach unique. One, as you said, is that to date, what implementation there has been at the federal level has been almost entirely through executive agencies. Um, and the U.S. has currently a, a pretty strong administrative state and a pretty recalcitrant uh, legislative arm. Um, and so I think <clears throat> those those dynamics uh, are what led the White House to issue the um, uh, the executive order in October 2023, uh, directing specific executive agencies to take on parts of this, which is, you know, very much like a traditional U.S. approach in that it's sector specific, right? Um, I think it is unlikely that we will see a sort of omnibus, all sector, uh, nationwide AI set of regulations or laws um, in the U.S. in the near future. Um, we've, you know, kind of traditionally uh, done stuff in a very sectoral approach, um, and so we will, you know, rather than have um, a law about AI or even an executive agency that governs AI broadly. It will be, you know, the Equal Employment Commission will govern AI in the context of employment and uh, housing and urban development will govern AI in the context of housing. Um, you know, the idea that the subject matter expertise is more applicable than, uh, you know, particular technological expertise. Um, we also bring up the role of the states. And, you know, I think that um, at its best, the, you know, strong state government model in the U.S. allows states to be these sort of laboratories of, of legal innovation, right, where they can try stuff, they can be faster, they can be more responsive, and uh, they can try out models that eventually then move to the federal level. And, you know, we've certainly seen that plenty of times, you know, like our own state of Massachusetts provided the model for uh, what became um, uh, the Affordable Care Act at the federal level, you know, about, you know, about 10 years later. Um, um, uh, and then, um, you know, but I think at its worst, um, what we can see is states that are uh, creating this like hodgepodge of um, uh, mismatched laws uh, that uh, end up, you know, creating incredibly complex um, uh, compliance uh, decisions for private actors, but, you know, also state actors that are looking to procure um, AI. Um, uh, but even at the state level, I think the predominant model right now seems to still be largely sector specific. I think some um, some states, especially I think here of California, are you know likely to maybe try something ambitious like a sort of generalized um, AI law. But if you look through what's happening in most other states, um, it is a lot of very specific laws. So like, for example, in New York, New York has had a very strong focus on use of AI in employment decisions. So hiring, firing, promotion, and regulating those. Other states, you'll see specific things about the use of AI by law enforcement, right? Or the use of AI in the court system or the use of AI in making housing and lending decisions. So still like a very sector specific approach. And I think we're likely to see that continue in the US where emphasis is put on the business matter expertise rather than creating a sort of uh, you know, generalized AI executive agency. Um, and I think it may be a long time before a national AI policy really emerges. Wonderful. Uh, that uh, I, I 
appreciate you providing that context, Mason. Um, I might move on uh, now uh, to uh, Gabrielle, um, who uh, we're, we're lucky to have join us. Gabrielle is the lead author of the EU AI Act. Uh, he has been working at the European Commission, uh, working in the context of law, uh, tech law and policy for the past seven years. Um, and so uh, naturally, we would like to ask you, uh, Gabrielle, about the AI Act. Um, the, um, you know, we've we've heard about uh, uh, approaches from um, around the world. Uh, we, we hope to get back to the approaches from the African continent. But these are every approach um, is in response to the EU's um, work um, and uh, that includes not only government approaches, but also companies everywhere. So can you uh, start off by providing a brief overview of what the act is and, and what it covers? Yes, hello, Les, and uh, thanks for, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you and all the other uh, panelists. Um, yeah, indeed. Uh, the EU has moved forward uh, fast, and I would say, um, you know, the first in this space. And it has moved with an approach that is actually pretty much the opposite of what Mason has been discussing so far. So essentially what in the US you would call as a sort of an omnibus type of legislation. And this started this approach quite early on primarily also because of the political mandate that we received um, in 2019, when President von der Leyen was uh, appointed to be the president of the commission. And she proposed a number of programmatic guidelines, including legislation on AI. And of course, there were a number of technical discussions around how should we go about it? Should we do a bit more sectorally? Should we do more horizontally? And Overall, in the end, the, the preference was for a more omnibus type of approach. Um, most likely, you know, partly because indeed there was that this was clearly within the mandate received. Um, but also there was a sense, a bit of concern that if you would go for a more sectoral approach, that could have led different sectors to be regulated differently. Um, and of course, the other side of the, of the equation is that when you go with the same approach across the board, you, you have a bit to find a common approach which fits all others. And that's a bit the complexity that we had to face. Um, so we'll see whether ultimately we will be able to find the right balance. But certainly, um, the moment we decided to go for a horizontal approach, we knew very well that, uh, in, first of all, that would not be the only legislation applicable to AI because there are a lot of other le sectoral legislation that apply. And so we had to make a number of specific considerations about that to avoid overlaps and repetitions. And, um, and that was certainly perhaps the, the most complex part of the exercise. Um, but in essence, so if we go a little bit more into the content uh, of the AI Act, so, um, Apart from being horizontal, meaning for, for those of you who are maybe less familiar, means that essentially they accept very specific sectors that are excluded primarily for political reasons uh, or reasons linked to the fact that the EU is not the sovereign state, but it's actually an international organization. Like, for instance, uh, exclusion around national security, exclusion around military and defense. These are areas that in the EU uh, you know, all the other being politically, of course, sensitive for the member states. It's also areas that uh, who's, where the competence of the EU is not always so straightforward. But apart from these areas, essentially, the AI Act covers all social and economic sectors from employment to education to law enforcement, immigration, um, products, financial services. So fairly, fairly broad. I, I wouldn't say there are any sectors that are excluded. And... Um, and therefore, the main idea that we put forward was the risk-based approach. So the risk-based approach essentially is the idea to regulate the use of the technology depending on the specific use that the technology is put to. Uh, 
and therefore the type of regulation will be tailored to that specific use. So we have three essential layers of um, re regulation, the cases where AI technology would be uh, prohibited, the cases where AI technology is allowed but subject to certain compliance requirements, and the cases where the AI technology is allowed but subject to disclosure type of requirements. So I'll leave it here, here and maybe we can discuss more details later. That's a perfect transition. Thank you, Gabrielle, because the next section we're going to be speaking about is actually risks and rights. Um, and so maybe I will uh, stay stay with you for a moment uh, and then and then we will we will move on to Ridwan uh, and and uh, shift that question a little bit so that you can talk about uh, both this the topic of this section and the last section, Ridwan. Um, but um, so you've explained a little bit about the EU's approach to risk. Um, and behind that, you must have thought a great deal about not only the benefits of this approach, but you know the weaknesses. Um, and so going forward, as you think about what happens next uh, for your work, uh, what uh, what do you what are your what are you excited about with the risk-based approach? and what are you concerned about? And how um, do you anticipate uh, the EO might mitigate any of the concerns um, uh, that you that you foresee? Um, yes, thanks for for this question uh, because it's true. Um, I had to think about it a lot. Um, what was clear to me since the get go is that it didn't make sense to regulate AI as a technology as such, because indeed what we're dealing with here is a general purpose technology that has a variety of application that we don't even foresee today. So very large variety of application. And therefore, from my perspective, the idea to establish rules for the technology as such, regardless of its use, didn't make any sense. Um, and therefore we, we came up with this approach of establishing rules depending on specific use to which the technology is put. With the greatest, let's say, burden from a regulatory point of view being on the high risk. Uh, because the high risk situation, and by the way, we are dealing with risks that are both linked to the safety and health of persons. Uh, imagine, for instance, uh, cases of AI that is a component of products um, like automated cars or drones or medical devices or robots. So therefore, we, we see more and more, of course, in the last few years, an increase in the digitalization of products, including with AI. And that, of course, creates some additional risk linked ultimately to the protection of the health and safety of person, because these uh, products can have a direct impact on the health and safety of person. And then there is another area of risk, but it, this is still coming from the same type of technology when AI essentially is supporting or replacing human decision making. Think about indeed cases around um, loan applications or use of algorithms in the case of education and so on. And here we're dealing more with risk around fundamental rights, like for instance, discrimination, um, lack of transparency of accountability uh, and so on. Um, and so the main concern was to make sure, because in this case of high risk, uh, there are also benefits in using AI, you know, by uh, creating more efficiency in decision making, improving decision making, uh, you know, making our, our products safer. So we had to find that balance. How do we make sure that on the one hand, we, we create a regulation that can cater for the risk, but at the same time, doesn't create too much of a burden on, on, on the development and, and use of those systems. And so our choice was to adopt uh, the approach that is taken in product legislation in the EU by essentially requiring uh, those systems that are classified as a risk to have a C mark. The C mark signals that the product, the system, is in compliance with, with the EU law and can therefore be sold and circulate in the EU. When it comes to the substantive requirements, there we did not really have to think too much uh, in the sense that, uh, as um, Carlos uh, was mentioning before, uh, 
there has been quite a large number of reports and documents around uh, the trustworthiness of AI, what is needed for AI to be ethical. And so things, for instance, around data sets or quality of data sets, uh, things around documentation, things around accountability, things around transparency, things around human oversight. These are things that are quite universally considered as important to ensure uh, that AI is, is safe and trustworthy. And in the EU, we relied in that sense quite a lot on the work of the high-level expert group, which is, was a group set up in 2018 until 2020, which advised the Commission on these matters. So therefore, the products, the AI systems that need to be uh, certified need to be certified against compliance with these principles. Thank you. That's super helpful, uh, Gabrielle. Really appreciate that. Um, I would like to, with my fingers crossed, see if we could get uh, Ridwan um, at least on audio, if not video. Let's let's try Ridwan to see if we can we can uh, get you on the line. All right. Um, please come to the now. Wonderful. Okay, so right. awesome. Let's. Uh, I, I'm so glad to hear your voice. Um, and. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd love to just uh, go back actually to um, the initial question I asked you about, you know, what can you tell us some of your findings uh, from the report that uh, you wrote on behalf of your organization, CERTA? Uh, and, um, you know, if there are any particular areas related to risk frameworks uh, and rights concerns, uh, perhaps highlight those as well. All right. Great. Um, so, the, the work in Africa has um, started quite in, I mean, if you look at what we've seen in the last five, six years thereabouts, um, we've seen regional bodies and also even the African Union trying um, different initiatives around um, governance of AI. But more significantly, uh, part of what we saw in the reports is that um, there are increasing number of African countries with um, national strategies. And under this strategy, one of the key pillars you find there is um, governance that reflects um, how the country, for example, is thinking about um, the regulation, but also thinking about the risk that the technology brings. And what we've seen in this regard is, as we speak currently, there are about five countries who have been able to do that, and more countries are also in the conversation, Nigeria, big economies like Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa. Um, another interesting thing is also um, a country like Rwanda, Berlin, for example, that has a specific national AI policy. Um, but outside of that, we're also seeing uh, more countries put out documents, principles around how they think about AI. And these principles are very closely linked or inclined towards what you see in the UNESCO um, document, for example, and also the OECD. Um, we also have um, countries like um, Egypt put out a charter, a national AI charter, which is also very principle-based, heavy on principles, um, giving a sense of direction. We've seen countries come up with roadmaps. And part of the key item in this roadmap is also um, the governance um, elements. And another thing that has also manifested is also how some African countries have also discussed AI, not specifically in the strategy or a policy, but it's also you know, under um, the digital policy. And they've also kind of considered this. And also, again, like I said, um, a key component of what you see in these documents is also um, laying a roadmap for governance elements. Uh, another thing we've seen is also that uh, about 15 African countries, as we speak currently, have either created an agency, um, a task force, a committee, um, an expert body, um, specifically for AI. I mean, why their mandate is not um, specifically around governance? Um, one thing we've seen consistently is also they keep making key recommendations um, that are so closely linked to how the country, for example, is thinking about um, governance. Um, another thing we also see is also like a sector-based approach that we've seen in some countries, Egypt, South Africa, Nigeria, where the Security and Exchange Commission, for example, have introduced um, regulations around robo-advisory. And it's kind of like very specific around um, the use of AI technology in this specific sector. We've also seen um, Tanzania that has been bold enough to put out this sector specific documents on healthcare and more countries are also thinking about um, this sector based approach to regulation basically saying you know what we're leaving it to the sector regulators to do whatever it is they want to do about um, the unique nuance the risk and all of that um, another interesting thing is also a um, number of countries who have specific draft laws who are trying to put out specific laws so bigger economies like again kenya nigeria 
um, I've talked about, um, I've actually a working draft of an AI legislation, same with Egypt and Morocco. Um, we've also seen um, other countries like Zimbabwe, Uganda, where the parliament has also been very vocal and also talked about or mooted an idea of introducing um, an AI legislation. Another thing I want to talk about quickly is also how we're seeing sector specific regulators do something. So, for example, um, the data protection authorities have taken more significant responsibility as far back as 2016. In 2018, for example, Morocco placed a moratorium on the use of facial recognition technology for a year, after which it put out two different documents or guidelines around facial recognition can be used. Uh, we've seen the same thing in Senegal, how facial recognition can be used in workplace. And quite a number of other countries are also using the data protection regulator to put out um, different documents. Outside of this, we've seen countries like Tunisia trying to amend its um, intellectual property law, for example, to recognize um, algorithm consideration and a bunch of innovations or part of a uh, bunch of in initiatives that we've seen from different African countries. So we put it together. Um, what we've seen around the risk is also the fact that a lot of countries are talking about this risk. They are thinking it. Um, even at the African Union level, there are different initiatives around having a continental AI strategy. One is being led by the EU NEPAD, and there's another by the African Union Commission. And once you see this is many of the key points that will be talked about here will cascade into so many national initiatives that we'll see that will come afterward. But the key thing around risk is um, the data protection authorities, the competition authorities in these markets, are having bigger conversation, there are deeper collaborations that are happening. Um, last year, the competition authorities in Africa came together and put out a statement. And part of what they said was around the role of technology in digital services. And now they would work together with other authorities like the data protection authorities to rein it in. So um, increasingly we're seeing this from product safety to intellectual property, to competition law, to consumer protection, to data protection, taking some sort of like a de facto role um, when it comes to the risk side of uh, AI applications. Thank you. Thank you, Ridwan. Um, uh, um, I'm going to uh, kind of uh, pass what you said on to Carlos because you did such a nice job touching on the uh, the sectoral aspects, the rights aspects, and also the risks aspects. And I know, Carlos, that you have. Um, have worked, as I, as I mentioned earlier, across uh, Latin America and beyond on not only AI policy, but policy more broadly. And one of the things that, um, that I have often heard you speak about is um, the ways in which in Brazil and, uh, and, and, and in, in other countries that you have worked with uh, have really created pathways for uh, citizens, for individuals to, um, to uh, ad address their rights through the judicial systems of their countries, um, which uh, is certainly a model um, that we don't see as strongly um, presented in other regions in the world. So Carlos, would you mind sharing um, uh, examples, whether from Brazil or other countries you have worked with on how this approach works and um, you know, and perhaps what others might learn from that from that approach. Thanks, Liz. Uh, and I think it's super interesting to to plug that out right after uh, Ridwan's uh, remarks, because uh, when we look uh, in the situation of Brazil, and I would say in the region as well, um, when we think about the new proposals for AI regulation that we're seeing in different countries. Um, I would say two things, and that might be a little bit provocative, uh, stand out uh, when we when we see those uh, proposals. So first, uh, it's usually um, very much there in those texts, a chapter on liability of um, companies that end up uh, providing, developing, uh, AI applications. And, and that is something that I think it's uh, resounds pretty much on countries of uh, um, a, a civil law uh, tradition. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's very much interested to take a look on how this conversation is moving forward. Because, for instance, uh, in the Costa Rican uh, proposal, 
there is like a very broad provision saying that like uh, all AI applications will be under a strict liability regime and that's it. Uh, if you double down to Brazil, uh, it's, it's the very same thing. So we have this provision for uh, high risk uh, to be on a strict liability uh, regime. And for those who are not right risk, uh, we still have in our current proposal, a liability regime that is more severe that you will have in the general law. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because that will end up creating uh, for people who are affected by uh, AI application, the resorts to go up to courts uh, and then to file lawsuits against uh, uh, the companies that have provided uh, those AI applications. But one thing that uh, I think it's interesting in this conversation is that if we turn out to have the chapters of uh, liability on our AI laws more severe than what we have in our general law for like um, other situations, if we are all in agreement that in the future, AI is going to be in everything, the legislators that are designing those laws today, they are designing general laws on liability because we will have AI in, in almost all sectors. So the decisions that we're making today on liability, they might end up scraping the, the provisions that you have on your civil code, consumer protection code, because the AI law will be the law that is more recent, more specific, and that might be the one that will be applying in most cases. So I would just like to, to, to like spotlight this discussion about like uh, how do we create this balance on uh, protecting rights and at the same time, getting it right uh, when it comes to liability, because like that's the provisions that will stand out uh, in the future. And just to conclude, uh, mentioning two topics uh, that we're seeing uh, across the region, uh, out of this Brussels effect, of course, uh, the AI, the European uh, AI Act is uh, pretty much uh, on the basis of what we see uh, in some provisions uh, across the across the region. But there is one thing that uh, I think it's interesting for us to ponder on, on Latin America and the region uh, as a whole, which is uh, who is going to um, supervise, investigate, and make sure that those, those provisions are going to be complied with uh, by the private sector. You will need a certain uh, bureaucracy to make sure that the law is deployed as we wanted it to be. And we know this is a conversation uh, in Europe uh, about how national authorities uh, are going to uh, enforce the law and how do this will going to play out. Uh, but when you take this outside of Europe and you think on other countries, that are somewhat reflecting on uh, the provisions that we see on, a, on the European Act, uh, we have to make sure that we have the, the, the abilities, the structure, the resources, in order to make sure that a, a, a AI law that puts a lot of burden, a lot of activities in the public sector, that the public sector will be able to deliver. Uh, because that would create all sorts of confusions and uh, distrust and I would say malfunctions uh, once the law is enforced that we don't want that to happen. Uh, so I think that's a second point uh, of interest uh, in this whole conversation about how do we see the region moving forward. I would I, I would point, point out liability and the structure of enforcement that I think uh, countries around the world might not have what Europe has uh, to make sure that that happened uh, in the first place. But I'll just stop here. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to pass this on to Mason because I think it's a great uh, set of things that are that align very much with what I, I know, Mason. You often um, th think about, um, you know, um, I'll frame it a little bit, but but 
but but hearing you uh, speak to both these liabilities and rights issues in the context of the U.S. in response to what Carlos said was just generally interesting. Uh, the U.S. is known for being a country that supports innovation and is home to many uh, tech companies at the same time um, has an established rights framework that it could be applied to technology. So I'd love to hear how you think uh, the U.S.'s existing framework, such as the Bill of Rights, Title VII, the U.S.'s uh, Civil Rights Act, uh, serves as a foundation for U.S. AI policy. Um, what would, if, if that sort of implementation happened, what would that yield? Um, and, you know, what would what would it mean for a model as compared to what um, what Carlos was describing uh, just now, and also the the sort of the approach that um, that Gabrielle was um, describing earlier, um, and 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 I guess the last bit is there's the sort of sectoral question, which I know Ridwan had brought up um, in the uh, in the African context as well. Yeah. Thanks. Um... Yeah, I think I think um, you know what the U.S. what what is happening in a lot of jurisdictions in the U.S. Um, and what is kind of foreshadowed by the executive order is this uh, confirmation that existing uh, rights based regimes, so especially Title Seven for employment, um, Title Nine for uh, gender based discrimination. Um, uh, Equal Employment Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, all these uh, very, you know, kind of targeted rights-based um, laws we have um, can either be applied or with small modifications extended to um, harms coming from the use of uh, AI systems. And I think that there's, um, there, there are potential upsides to this approach. Um, one is that, um, uh, in uh, a country like the U.S., where our legislative branch is you know, pretty notoriously slow to develop things, um, it would be advantageous uh, to be able to make the smallest changes necessary. And in some cases, uh, enforcement agencies may even have the power under their existing mandates to make those changes, right? Um, so an example I use a lot is Title VII employment discrimination. Um, it's already unlawful to uh, discriminate uh, in hiring, firing, promotion, retention uh, on the basis of various protected classes, such as uh, race, gender, sexual preference, religion, nationality. Um, and, um, you know, one could see uh, a system where rather than creating an AI Employment Act, um, there are just small adjustments made to Title VII uh, to make it more amenable to apply to algorithmic hiring practices. Um, and this would probably require um, in looking at some things about like, for example, how we define intent, right? Because uh, where there's discriminatory intent, it's a little harder to demonstrate that um, when an algorithm uh, decision-making system. Now I will say the U S is, um, you know, kind of well positioned to take this approach because it's, a, a, you know, it's a common law uh uh, system of uh, a legal system, right? Which means that judges have powers, uh, have relatively strong powers to reinterpret the law, and the high courts can reinterpret the law in ways that are, you know, binding on the law, lower courts uh, without, you know, um, actually uh, rewriting uh, the, the, a civil code, right? So we have a little more flexibility on that front. Um, uh, you know, I also think that there's sort of a technical, I think there's a socio-technical advantage here, right, which is that I think the idea that uh, the emergence of AI needs to be met with an entirely new set of laws gives a lot of power to the AI developers. Um, I think it, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it kind of, um, you know, aligns with their message that, AI is completely transformative and it is not subject to governance under existing laws. And I do think it's useful to push back on that a bit and say like, whoa, you know, like just because we don't have, you know, a federal AI act yet in the US does not mean that you can do whatever you want, right? We still have plenty of existing laws. Uh, they apply very well. And I do think existing laws in many sectors get us 80, 90, 95% of the way there. I think it varies. I, I think there are certain situations where the use of AI is um so uh 
paradigm changing that it's harder to apply existing laws. I think intellectual property is a great example of this. Folks are really struggling in the U.S. to apply uh, existing copyright doctrine um, to generative AI. But in a lot of the kind of, um, you know, when it comes to some of, some of the more rights-based statutes we have, I think actually uh, we have a pretty good governance model right there. And we just need some small adjustments around the edges um, to modernize those statutes and bring them in line, not just a with AI, but to hopefully, um, if not future proof them, uh, at least uh, provide a little bit more stability for whatever comes next after AI. Thank you, Mason. Um, and I, I might stick with you for this last round because you you mentioned the intellectual property element uh, of um, of this of regulating AI. So in this last round, which will be a bit of more of a, a lightning round, um, I'm going to ask the speakers to just think forward on um, what. Um, what a global governance of AI would look like. Um, and certainly, Mason, starting with you, uh, I know you think a lot about uh, intellectual property in uh, issues with AI and, and beyond, uh, and mentioned that already. Um, so that's going to be a key issue going forward, and it's going to be cer certainly one that uh, crosses national boundaries. So can you can you describe what you would hope for uh, in, in terms of what, what the U.S. could do, but also what you would want to see, uh, you know, the world doing to protect intellectual property? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, what I would hope for is um, a, an international um, standard or regime that respects what I see as kind of the two primary driving forces behind intellectual property protection, especially copyright protection. Um, one of those, which I think is the dominant you know, thread in the U.S., is that, you know, copyright is an economic incentive system, right? The idea here is that you want to give people just enough protection to incentivize them to cre keep creating new works. Um, but beyond that, any additional pr protection is, is 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 a market harm, right? So you want this like, you know, it's all about driving creation. Um, but I think there's another theme which is present in U.S. law, but I think I think has a stronger um, uh, a stronger presence in uh, in other jurisdictions, especially I know in some European ju jurisdictions, um, which is the you know the moral rights um, of uh, people who produce creative works. Um, and I think that one of the things we're seeing in the in the discussion, especially uh, the popular discussion in the U.S., uh, you know, a lot of backlash against generative AIs that have used people's artwork uh, or writings without permission. And I think that what we're seeing is that the you know the sort of moral rights structure really resonates with the the you know a lot of people in the in the public in the U.S. Right. A lot of people are approaching this from an issue of, is this fair, not is this economically beneficial? Um, and I'd like to see an international regime that recognizes that, you know, there are multiple reasons to protect intellectual property. It's not all just about um, incentivizing the, the creation of, 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 valuable, um, of valuable property. Um, I know you didn't specifically ask, but I will say, like, what do I think is going to happen? I think it'll probably be more of a slow process of harmonization, as we've seen with intellectual property outside the AI space. Um, you know, I really, you know, would love to say that I am confident that the U.S. will become a more um, uh, equal participant in the international law discourse. But, you know, I think that that's you know, that we're talking about reversing decades, you know, centuries, really, of, you know, the U.S. kind of holding it itself apart from the international community. And I do think it's it would be great for that to change. But I think that uh, it'll it'll really take a concerted effort. Thank you, Mason. Um, there's no uh, way of talking about uh, global policies going forward without talking about the Brussels effect. And so this. Uh, uh, brings me to you, Gabrielle. Um, and, um, you know, what you hope for as the EU's AI Act moves in impl for in into implementation, um, what is the global impact you hope for? And, um, uh, you know, how might it interact with um, 
with some of the other approaches you've you've heard about on this call today? Uh, I think that what I would hope for certainly is the fact that SDU has been the first in, in developing um, this uh, approach to AI regulation that indeed it can certainly promote other jurisdiction in, in identifying what are effectively the good things about, you know, uh, SDU has gone into this process, the good things about this process that would deserve consideration. So I think, for instance, that um, the fact that um, although this may ver vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, um, but I think probably there could be some convergence around the fact that um, we want to make sure that certain applications around AI, um, like for instance, those can lead to discrimination in, in hiring or firing, you know, are you know generally considered to be risky and therefore should be subject to some sort of oversight. Now, what that specific oversight should be probably uh, probably can you know may not necessarily be the same. It may not be necessarily the C mark that we have in view, as Mason was saying. Um, you know, there may be things around uh, already applicable law in certain jurisdiction, but I think this is probably our most innovative idea that I think uh, I would like to see somewhat taken on board. Um, but then, if I think about implementation more generally. Um, I think that certainly on our end in the EU, uh, and here I'm referring also to what Carlos was mentioning before, I think certainly we, we have some work to do in terms of um, authorities in the EU that will have to ensure uh, effective implementation of the AI Act. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, the AI Act is horizontal, has a large impact on several uh, sectors. And it's based on public enforcement. So therefore, authorities will have to ensure that they have the resources to really uh, ensure the proper implementation of the act. And these are not just financial resources, but also ultimately uh, knowledge-based resources, so having the proper experience and so on. And, and in general, on, on the last point I want to make uh, quickly, um, when it comes to this new type of AI that is, you know, sometimes is called generative AI or general purpose AI and that we have specifically regulated in the EU, uh, notably in the last uh, few weeks, final stages of, of the negotiations. I think I would like to see there certainly more international coordination because there we are dealing with a number of questions that I think are pretty common uh, across jurisdictions. Uh, I mean, for instance, you know, the IP issue or the, mis the misinformation. So I think there I would like to see certainly more, more international coordination. Thank you, Gabriel. I, I want to pass this on to Ridwan. Um, uh, we've you talked earlier about the the various approaches that have been taken by different countries across the African continent, um, and we've heard uh, just from where Gabriel ended, for example, of the need for intellect uh, in international coordination. Um, an advantage of being slower is you can learn from others. And so I wonder what you see happening now in terms of what you would hope for next and also how you would see um, countries in Africa playing a leadership role going forward um, uh, in, the, in the regulation of AI. Uh, I think my opinion about this is that, um, as we've seen with the regulation of other domains uh, like data protection, quite a number of other things that we've seen where um, sometimes we look out to, you know, sometimes take inspiration to then work around framework. I think um, we have an opportunity to do things differently this time around. And why I say that is because um, from the kind of things that we're seeing already, the kind of conversation that is happening on the continent or in some parts of the continent, uh, there is that uh, from even the regulatory um, quarters, you're seeing that awakening about how um, there is like the need for the local context and how you adopt and how you kind of, even if you're trying to replicate, the need to pay attention to local context. So my own projection is that uh, what we're going to see is um, we might see some sort of like a clearinghouse model image where not every country in Africa, for example, will try to come up with a specific AI regulation. Uh, we might see classification of risk. 
and where the different regulators from the border safety to data protection to consumer protection competition law um anti anti-discrimination laws for example the human rights councils who enforce these laws would may then take more responsibility uh, because what it means also is that if we want to like follow the eu ai act model it simply means creating a new body a new funding new competence um, when we can leverage the existing bodies that we have already and then help them either grow capacity um, leverage and fund make sure they are properly resourced but more importantly is also um reviewing the existing laws that they have um to make their sort of amenable to address some of these um risk and the things that we're going to see in the future because AI is here today tomorrow is going to be a different technology and we can't keep legislating for every new technology that we have um another thing I'd like to add to the conversation is that um, we also see what we, um, um, there's also like a great number of, so one of the key conversations is how much is Africa participating in these conversations when it comes to shaping global governance. And um, even if it's um, just um, a little effort, um, part of what we saw, what probably identified in the report is um, when, it came to, when it came to, at the UN level, when it came to the discussion around um, the use of um, AI in warfare situation, um, quite a number of African countries were part of that conversation. Um, we're seeing African countries push their solutions at the level of the Global Privacy Assembly. Um, the new UN expert bodies that was that was recently established, for example, you see African um, Africans who are also part of this um, conversation. Um, but one thing that is central, one thing that is key is um, all of this representation needs to go beyond tokenism. It needs to also reflect um, the national interest or the regional interests of, um, of the continent. Uh, but more importantly, is also creating a space, um, but creating a space for people to meaningfully contribute. Um, there are still, you know, you look at issues around, there's a need for us to be part of conversation, but then there are still restrictions around even mobility when it comes to immigration and all of that. So um, first, as a continent, we need to look inward and do so much more for, um, based on all of the ongoing conversations, the collaborations we're seeing between the different authorities, data protection, competition, um, we need to deepen that collaboration. We need to build competence, we need to build capacity, we need to build resource properly. Uh, but more importantly is also, again, like I said, um, participation should go beyond tokenism. It should be meaningful participation. And I think that's what's really going to count. And those are the things that I see here. Thank you so much, Ridwan. Carlos, I'm going to pass it to you for the last word on your hopes for uh, what can global governance look like going forward regarding AI. That's such a great responsibility, uh, but I'll go. I'll go super quick. Uh, and and following this uh, majority world approach, uh, especially thinking about the 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 role of Europe as this uh, big um, digital regulation influencer uh, that we are discussing uh, here. I think when we turn to countries in the majority world, uh, especially out of the uh, impacts of the GDPR, uh, they are going through in the last, I would say, six years, seven years, uh, trying to establish data protection authorities uh, that right now, when this second wave, such to say, which is AI, end up reaching those countries, uh, data protection ended up serving as an entry point uh, for those discussions. So my my final remark in, in, in trying to, to look into this global conversation is that data protection might be an accelerator, might be an entry point uh, for countries in the majority world because that's the conversation that we have been having in the last decade. And that's where uh, resources, attention have been moving forward uh, in those in those countries. But then AI feels like uh, this, this second wave. Uh, and of course, other areas of interest end up uh, applying here, such as intellectual property, as Mason uh, said, such as consumer protection, uh, as Ridwan was bringing in and competition. So I think when we look into this global uh, discussion, it's a global discussion that, of course, AI regulation will be a bubble on itself. But we need to take care that uh, other areas serve as an entry point for the conversation about the future of AI, such as IP, competition, consumer protection. And I think that's the mess that we're heading into. How do we make sure that we have the conversation on AI being taking place? And at the same time, having the much needed attention 
to all impacts that AI will have in the areas of IP competition, customer protection, and data protection, and so on. Because it's important to mention, data protection does not overlap all the conversation about AI. And that's, and that's tricky for countries that are legislating right now because we might use data protection law as our framework to deal with uh, AI. And we might leave a lot of important areas uh, out of scope if we only focus on data protection. But I'll just stop here. And thanks a lot, Liz. Uh, great pleasure to, to be in this discussion with, with great friends and experts. Uh, learn a lot. As as did I, and I want to thank the panel and all the attendees for this conversation. Appreciate your time, um, and we hope to have more of these going forward. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining.